Welcome to Black Hat Windows 2K Security, held February 14th through the 15th, 2001, in Las Vegas, Nevada. The following videotape was recorded live at the conference and produced by the Sound of Knowledge Incorporated. This is videotape number 6D, a continuation. Deep Knowledge Track, IPSEC in a Windows 2000 World. Let's see here. What we're going to do next is uh, Dan and I are actually going to demonstrate setting up these uh, a couple of tunnels and doing some sniffs and showing you what they actually look like in the packets. Um, and then from there, William has got some more Win2K Kerberos and Ike Kerberos authentication usage and then some advanced stuff. So we're just starting to have fun now. Okay, so the first thing we're going to set up is a pretty standard uh, transport mode authenticated header. And so we're going to take a look at uh, how this is configured. You ready for me? Yep. All right, so as you can see here, what I did is I went straight to the MMC. So I'll show you, I mean, pretty basic. Just brought up the MMC. Add a move snap in. <laughs> or in, uh, there's a few, a couple snap ins you can bring up. I'll bring up the uh, IP security policy management for this local machine. As you can see here, you can manage this local machine or you can manage domain policy for this computer's domain or for another domain or another computer. So all this stuff that we're doing here, like say we set this, this, these two boxes to communicate, we could set up every box in the entire domain to use IPsec just from this one rule and we could apply it to the entire domain. Um, as soon as it hooks back up, it'll pick up that policy. All right, so this is the configuration. What's that? Whether it'll pull, what is what dependent on that? whether it'll pull the policies down? Well, there'll have to be policies defined for it to pull down, if that's what you mean, yeah. Oh yeah, that's, that's not the same kind of thing at all. <laughs> Definitely different concept. That, that's one of the problems, really. Windows 2000 is really a different beast as far as administration goes than NT4. Um, they've, I, I personally think they finally did something kind of right. <laughs> um, Active Directory with group policy is really cool. All right, so I'm going to create a, an IP security policy. As you see here, it brings up this nice friendly wizard. Um, we'll call this H tunnel mode, or transport mode, sorry, that's right. Or mode. And uh, what's that? H transport mode. And you'll see why we add this in here. It actually is very useful. We're going to turn off, the, activate the default response rule for this. Um, what that does is basically it, it becomes the default way that it handles IP traffic and I don't really, we don't want to do that. Um, all right. So now we have this new rule here. I'm not going to use the wizard as you can see, but I need to add a new security rule. So we add and we're going to have to add a rule here, an IP filter list. See we have no filter list. What's that? What's that? Oh. And we're going to give it a name here, um, H tunnel, or no, transport. I keep. Okay. That's from you? Traffic to from Dan. All right. And we're going to add a policy. This is going to be from Dan, from a specific IP address, or not DNS name specific IP address, and we're going to put in that computer's IP address, three, to my IP address, and we're going to have it mirrored. What? Oh. All right. I'm horrible with this mouse. Okay, my IP address, and we're going to have it mirrored um, so that the, it'll basically create two rules, one for each direction. We'll okay that. We'll close this. So now we have our, we'll, 
set that, and then we're going to set a filter action. All right, so we want it to negotiate security. You see here we have permit, block, and negotiate, the three basic uh, principles in IP security. Permit, obviously, if it comes in this way, it'll just allow it. Block, it'll just automatically block. Negotiate security is how you actually handle the, um, the IPsec negotiation. So we're going to add through. We are doing um, AH, the default configuration. And we're going, did you uncheck the accept? OK. Uncheck accept unsecured communications, but always respond using IPsec. So this box will not respond to anything but IPsec. I forgot to rename it. I'm sorry? Right, right. It has to, it's the filter rule. It, that's saying how that filter rule is applied. And that filter rule is applied that any traffic from me, if it's not IPsec traffic, then it must be spoofed. So I'm going to drop it. That's what it's saying. Okay, so as you can see here, we're using MD5 for a hash algorithm, and there's no uh, ESP involved. Okay, so we turn that on. The authentication method right now we have is set as Kerberos. Now, oh, you forgot that part, didn't you? <laughs> now, this is not going to work because we don't have a domain set up. So we're actually going to do it the far unsecure way. Now try not to look at our pre-shared key. It's very secret. Yep. <laughs> and it's a tunnel setting here. You see we say this rule does not specify an IPsec tunnel. And we uh, see that it's applied, that we've got the check, the check marks there saying it's there. Um, let me bring my network sniffer up real quick. Okay, we're going to get ready to start a new one as soon as this goes off. Um, it was default. Yeah, we just chose default. All right, and now I'm going to go ahead and assign this. Are you assigned? All right, so now we should be negotiating. Where'd all my traffic go? Actually, I think I screwed up. Let's start this up again. But let's look at, we'll look at our tunnel right now. As you can see here, this is IPsec uh, monitor, and we have one um, SA, Security Association in our database. Actually two because there's one for each direction, but this shows one. Um, and it shows the, the policy name, the security that's being used. This is the filter and the address and the destination address. Is there a place to I don't think so. Not in, not in uh, Win 2000 and I don't Um, uh, did, so the question I have is in, uh, the question was, does this show any of the, uh, the Ike uh, essays, which it does not? The Oakley log will. The, the Oakley yeah. log will, yeah. Th th this is a really basic, Fact. basic monitor. It tells you what's active. And what's active are actually two IPsec essays. Um, it's two IPsec essays. There's an inbound essay and there's an outbound essay. The IPsec monitor shows only the outbound essay, right? And it shows you basic protocol behavior. Um, it's, it's really intended to be kind of transparent. Um, and I, you know, we have a much better monitoring tool to see exactly everything in Whistler. All right. So there here, I turned logging on for IKE. And as you can see here, this is our Oakley log. Oh, it's, it, I mean, there's detailed protocol logging in Ike, right? Yeah, so that's. 
it's, it's oakley.log. I mean, it's you shouldn't, oakley. shouldn't have to go to oakley log. You should be able to look in the audit. It just enables security auditing uh, for log on, log off events. But if uh, that doesn't tell you enough, because you could just do that dynamically without setting the reg key, right? We always audit. It's up to the audit system to actually record that audit or not. So, so in here it shows um, how many, like I said, main modes, how many quick modes we've done. It shows uh, any problems along the way and how much bytes have actually been sent. And as you can see, the active associations. I assume that means pair of associations. Uh, well, it just shows you one security association because there can be many and then you get confused. There's okay. always two. Whenever yeah. you secure traffic, right. there's always two. Okay. What's that? Okay. Well, my sniffer was seem to be being flaky because I forgot to set up the network. It's, it's inside the Oakley log. It's the quick mode IPsec SA. Actually, the log technically is the audit log. So if you go to the security audit log, you'll see main mode SA establish, fail, you'll success fail, and you'll see quick mode success fail. And you'll see yep. exactly the parameters that were negotiated. And if it failed, it'll try to estimate why it failed. So really the audit log, the security audit log is, the, is your best um, initial debugging tool. All right, we hope you never have to do go more than that, but if you do, then there's the Oakley log. No. Okay, it's not that one work. Because of everything that we've done, aggressive mode gave away traffic confidentiality, and we didn't see a need to do it. You know, support a mode really that was weaker than what we had already. Okay. Um, the Ike RFC defines a bunch of different options that you can uh, support. One of those <coughs> options is uh, there, there are modes that you can negotiate in. One's called identity protect mode, which is what we support, and the other is called aggressive. Let's turn it off and turn it back on. Identity is not protected. Turn it off and, and turn it back on. In fact, the traffic that you're going to exchange is not protected. It's all proposed up in the clear. So I tell you who I am and what I want to do with you, <coughs> and then you come back. It's a faster. That's why it's called aggressive. It's a faster negotiation when you don't care about the security of the traffic that you're going to send. Okay. Right. Okay, we're, what, I'm, what we're doing, I'm going to just unassign mine and reassign it so we can actually capture the ICE negotiation as well. Yep. You missed that. Ready? Yep. Good. And you can see it flying off the map on the uh, on the uh, log. Yeah. Remember, Ike sets it up, and once it's up, all the traffic just flows. Right. All right. So here you have, you see, all the ICE cam traffic going by the, the Ike uses negotiation. And it shows the security association, the flag summary. The way I AMP works, it's basically a header and it tells you what follows and then the, uh, all the way down. It, it's just an SSC packet within the next one and, and each one will point to the next um, ISIC AMP header and then each header tells you what type it is. Um, so here you're going to have several different ISIC AMP um, capsules. Um, it's going to have an, uh, a whole list of the different SAs that will support um, for the ISIC And then, um, yeah, so these were all those. And if you notice, as we go down, come on back, buddy. We actually go into the ICMP traffic. Now, you notice it doesn't show any, anything different on the NetMon. But when you actually look at it, see we have here, oops, wrong one. We have our AH header. Oh, come on. <laughs> it's not my fault, it's NetMon. There we go. All right, so here you have the actual AH information. Here's the SPI, the sequence number. Um, but one thing that's interesting to point out that I, that I thought was important here is if you notice, like we said, and I guess just to reiterate it, this is not encrypted. So as you can see, all this data is completely available to you. For sniffing. For sniffing, right. as we just did. The, the value here is trusted communication. 
you can lock down a machine so that even though the communication is not encrypted, it will only communicate to trusted peers. Right? So IPsec enforces a trust model, and it can optionally do privacy on the wire. <coughs> There's, no, there's nothing you can do to prevent sniffing except to physically isolate the network. But if the traffic was sniffed like this, right. then you know, AH, will, will, the data will be visible. Right. Or ESP null encryption, the data would be visible. But with ESP DES or triple DES encryption, that would be garbage. What this does, what this does is pro or it, it keeps any um, third party attacks like uh, spoofing, packet injection, hijacking, all of that is stopped because I am um, authenticating the header as well. That's what this protects against. Yeah, you, it's not just, I mean, spoofing, no traffic. You can set it up so that no traffic will be received unless the guy is trusted. And the traffic that you do receive can't be replayed, right? Can't, you know, it basically has a cryptographic context across an IPsec secure association to be, to be exchanged. So AH is the lightest weight, right, of, of the security protocols. It, we run AH for build server distribution. Right? Nobody can get a build, uh, I shouldn't say nobody, but basically there's policy that you could configure, although we don't exactly do it this way, to say nobody can get a, a Windows build except authenticated machines. Right? That would be nice. But we happen to not do it completely locked down like that because we have standalone machines that don't know how to authenticate have to get upgraded. So I mean, there are cases, but in a more controlled environment as opposed to our development environment, you can, um, you can say that, you know, this machine will not communicate using this IP address to anybody unless I can positively authenticate them. And then when they do communicate, they'll either be encrypted or they'll at least have integrity protection on the traffic. So if anybody did see it, okay, so they see, you know, that you're ordering five widgets. They can't make that 100,000 widget, right, and replay the packet, and now your ordering system just got, you know, swamped with a bunch of bogus orders. That would be one attack, right? Modification. You can't modify the traffic. You can't replay the traffic. OK, so the next thing we're going to show you is another transport mode. And in this instance, we're going to go with the highest security. We're going to go with uh, AH and ESP working together. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to go and I'm going to create another one. First of all, I'm going to disable this one. One thing that's interesting you'll notice, um, time's out. I turned off the, the IPsec policy on my side. He's got it on his side and it doesn't work. Every once in a while you'll find when you turn yours on, and if his isn't on, in fact, what you'll probably get on his side is negotiating IP policy. And it comes back really quickly. I guess uh, they actually modified ICMP to return when you turn ICMP, uh, IP spec, IPsec on. Yeah, we, have, we had to be really, we wanted to allow some applications to know that IPsec was being, was there. But we couldn't change Winsock APIs and the return code values of you know, Winsock calls because applications may not expect value 10 <laughs> when they were only expecting values you know, 0 through 9. So uh, ICMP.dll is, uh, is something we ship. Only the uh, tool ping that we ship uses ICMP.dll. So we made ICMP.dll aware that uh, whether IPsec was going on. So there's some custom return codes that we return up to ping. Ping tells you whether IPsec has happened for the ping traffic. If you exempt ping, then ping won't tell you. OK, so I'm going to use this same um, filter again to, from Dan, because that's still applicable. But I'm going to create a new filter action. And I'm going to specifically, I'm going to go to security again. And I'm going to make it custom. And inside custom is where you can make some of those decisions. We're going to add AH, we're going to add ESP, and we're keeping the uh, integrity algorithms that are stock, MD5, MD5, and DES. You can switch these to triple DES. You can switch this to SHA-1 on both of them. Um, and here you can actually change your session key time, or generate, you can have a, generate a new session key after a certain amount of data goes across the wire or by amount of time. No. <laughs> I mean, it won't really show very much. It takes a lot of data. The, the minimum settings are 20 megabytes in five minutes. OK, so I forgot to make that rule change. Uh, no, we don't. It's, we support it. It's right there if you want it, but we don't. Right. Well, it's, the 
there's no default. You define your policy. So, I mean, it's the checkbox is checked with no common phrases. That's true. That's true. That's true. You, you know. Okay, that's that's a way to see default. <laughs> oh yeah, I guess he's. I, I get a little irritated when people say, "Oh, it just works this way by default." All right. But you have to define. Transform. Isn't this the one that shows up in a? No. It's not this one. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and uh, turn that one on. Uh, authentication method, we got to change this again. To use our super secret key, if everybody could turn away as I put this in. <laughs> Once again, no tunnel setting. Because this is not a tunnel, this is transport. Okay, so I'll go ahead and assign it. Are you ready to go? All right, start it up. All right, so take a look at this capture. <laughs> I like the little horsey. <laughs> As you can see here, once again, we have the ice camp traffic going by. And now we you notice that the protocol is listed as ESP. And everything is encrypted. It's all a bunch of gobbledygook. Here's the AH header as well, which does not show up in encrypted as it shouldn't. So as you can see, you definitely get a nice set of encryption going when you use ESP. What's that? <coughs> Nowhere. Oh, right here. Oh, OK. Next header shows ESP, right. And then the ESP next header is right? Right. Which would be TCP. Right, you can't see it because it's encrypted. So you have no idea what this packet is actually. Right. ICMP, yes. <laughs> okay, so that was basically what we wanted to show there. And what the heck happened there? So now what we're going to do is we're actually going to set it up tunnel mode. Um, actually, where's the IPsec mod? Let's show that really quick as well. Um, once again, you see a little bit, it's a little bit different. Security shows uh, ESP this time. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I think you use the actual filter. Right. Oh, you want to show that? Yeah. Okay. So the, the filter name right there says no name. If on every filter, not the filter list, but on every filter, there's a description field, and that's essentially the name field. So if you enter it in, it doesn't it doesn't get populated by default. But if you enter it in, then it would show up here in IPsec monitor. Okay, so the next thing we're going to show is the tunnel. Now, the tunnel is a little tricky. And the, the problem with, the, with a lot of this stuff is when you try to set it up, and when you don't set it up incorrectly, it just doesn't work. There's nothing to tell you what's gone wrong. In fact, there's this nice little feature here that's called, uh, where was that? Oh, yeah, check policy integrity, which I found did nothing other than say integrity verified. <laughs> well, let, let me explain. Check <laughs> <laughs> um, policy integrity. What you're looking at here is an entire store of policy objects. It's um, it's actually much more complicated than what the UI shows. There's a bunch of uh, independent objects that are all linked together, and this has uh, its origins in the fact that when we do LDAP policy. Well, actually, it has origins in the way the policy is designed. You can have filter lists which exist on their own and can be reused, right? So if you define a filter list for 200 servers, right, it would be stupid for us not to allow you to reuse that filter list, right? So you would have to like copy, you know, re-enter 200 filters again. So the filter lists and the filter actions are independent objects, right? And they're stored independently. You just link them together to form a security rule. The security rule itself is an independent object, right, which is linked to by the policy. You can't reuse a security rule, but it basically is stored independently. At one time, we could reuse it. <coughs> Three UI design <laughs> revisions, OK? Um, and very complicated configuration. So bottom line is independent filter list, independent filter action, 
separate objects that refer to those objects, and what can happen um, if somebody is messing around in the registry or you've been hacked or somebody's messing around in the directory and they're deleting policy objects uh, via um, other mechanisms, not the IPsec UI, but other mechanisms, you can end up having pointers to objects which don't exist. Okay, so the IPsec UI will ensure that, that everything is in good order and if there's ever any question about it, then you can run the policy integrity. So you're right. There is no integrity <laughs> problem if you're using the UI. Um, but if you go in there and whack in the registry and, and destroy these things, destroy the links or delete objects that are in use essentially uh, manually, because there's always another way to the store. It'll, in the UI, it'll say you can't find this object. No, it won't crash the MMC if that's what you mean. No, no, I mean like, just the, it will actually say which object doesn't have a pointer anymore. Or point, which um, it's it's been a while since I've looked at those error messages. I can't remember. Right. Well, oh. Uh, well, when you go into the UI, if it can't find a particular object, it'll tell you right then. It'll say bad reference or something like that. It won't tell you what object it's looking for. It won't tell you what object it's looking for. You'd have to look in the thing because in the end, it doesn't matter. It's gone. So you've got to recreate it. <coughs> okay. Okay. So we'll start with the, once again, we'll put a new one. Create IP. This will be age <coughs> ESP tunnel mode. So is it this description that shows up there? Or? No. Okay. This is policy. It's the actual individual filter itself. Okay. Um. No, you don't want that. Yeah. Did you cover default response filter? Um, I I mentioned it. Okay. But if you want to, I'll show it in another slide. How okay. It okay. Cover granularity of filters. Not yet. No, it's actually. Yeah, you, we, we haven't done that. You, you do cover that, though. And it's a, yeah, he's got it. All right, so well, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add in our, I, OK, so first of all, the way we have the filter list set up in, um, for the, the transport mode will not work in tunnel mode. And to be honest, I think I'd have to rely on William to explain why. But you, you cannot do mirror. You cannot mirror these rules. You have to make two independent rules. So we'll do that now. To Dan. So the tunnel rule is one UI to, to do everything. And originally we didn't support tunnel mode, and then we added tunnel mode. And fundamentally, <coughs> tunnel mode is no different than transport mode. It's a match against a filter. Right? When you you're, you're looking at it, the IPA driver is looking at packets on outbound and trying to determine what kind of action it should have on it. Block will be fine, but if it's negotiate security, then it'll either negotiate transport mode or negotiate tunnel mode. So the UI and the system really treats it no differently. Okay. It's just negotiating a particular way to secure the track. So if it's secure in tunnel mode or if it's secure in transport mode. The configuration of tunnel mode, however, requires that you specify that you specify the end of the tunnel. And in the way that, they, that, that we played with the UI, there was no good way to specify tunnels differently than transport, except as like a property page. Because it's, it's a property of the rule, right? It's a tunnel rule, as opposed or a tunnel filter. But the filter itself is the recognition of what traffic goes in the tunnel, not where it ends up. So you have the idea that there's a filter, it's either a transport or tunnel filter, but that decision is made on the rule level. So that's one of the best explanations I can give you. Um, is that configuration requires you to specify both tunnel endpoints. So what he's going to end up showing you is traffic on this side going to that, you know, to that side, the tunnel terminates here. Traffic from there back to here, the tunnel terminates over here. Right? So that's why there are two rules. So we create that rule, as I said, non-mirrored. And then we close this one. I sh yeah. Now, okay, so the filter action is, uh, we could just do a, this one, can't we? Yeah. yeah. We'll just use our ESPAH. 
Um, authentication, me authentication method, we'll use our super secret string again. Now this is the part that's one of the tricky parts right here. We're establishing a tunnel, and so we have to change this. Now, this is the tunnel that's to me, right? So the first thing that I thought about is that, or this is to you, sorry, this is to him. So the first thing that I thought of is the endpoint is me, because I'm trying to establish a tunnel with him. So when we set this up originally, it did not work. And the reason is, is that since the traffic is going to him, the endpoint is him. So then when I create my filter back that says traffic from him to me, the endpoint will be me. Now it's a little confusing. It's, it would have been, if I had a whiteboard here, I think we could probably draw it out, but we'll, we'll try this out. So this tunnel is going to be me. It's you. Oh, this is to you. This is to me. So this will be you. Uh, three. Uh. Oh. Yeah. Oops. All right, so I will add another one from Dan. And this will be from a specific IP address. And this will be to my IP address. And once again, it's not mirrored. Was it to Dan? I'm, I swear I'm getting so confused. Okay. I, I know. Well, I want to keep it in there, so. I'm adding a new one. From Dan, filter action is ESP. No, I did age ESP. <laughs> and this will be my IP address as the end of the tunnel. And I think I got all of it. Close, assign, is yours assigned? Yep. All right, now let's see if we actually have, there it is. Once again, we have our ice camp uh, negotiations. <laughs> All right, Ike negotiations and with all that data. And here we have our ESP data again. And this is our tunnel. As you can see, the IP header. This would probably look more interesting if we actually routed it through a gateway. But. There's at some point that the, the UI actually says that Microsoft doesn't recommend actually using tunnel mode unless you are trying to communicate with a router that does not support um, L2TP. And they, is it under tunnel setting? Yeah, I don't remember where it was. Yeah, it's, it's somewhere. And so basically they recommend L2TP at all points unless you actually have to use an IPsec tunnel. And I think figured, you know, this, this is not for the, for the average person, I'll say, right? I mean, IPsec tunneling takes a while to configure. You have to understand what's happening. You have to understand the filters put traffic in the tunnel. It's not a routing decision. So if you're at that level, then um, you know, you can configure as many IPsec tunnels as you want. You can have thousands of tunnels. Just like you can have thousands of clients talking to a server, you can have thousands of tunnels if you want. Um, it's just how much you Every tunnel has to be explicitly configured because you've got to specify the endpoint of the tunnel. <coughs> tunnel to there, and from there, on, back to the 
interface, I expect to receive this constant. Right? On this interface, I expect to receive this constant. So that's why we don't have the concept of V. Right? Yeah, it's really sort of the rest of the day. I guess it does sense. Right. 45 minutes. <laughs> okay. You have like two hours left of worth of stuff to do. Okay. Well, lucky for you guys, um, we're running kind of short on time. I thought the demo was kind of important to show because um, configuring tunnel mode is not obvious. There's a KB article on how to do it. The online help describes how to do it. But until you grok it. It's um, that tunnel endpoint thing that got me. Yeah. That was a tricky one. Um, OK, so where, where are we in the agenda? Um, we are just after the demo, kind of going a little bit late. I, uh, I've got some incredibly detailed slides on the Ike use of Kerberos and exactly the protocol uh, exchanges that I could talk to an Ike developer about. Um, if you're not an Ike developer and, uh, and we talked about Kerberos and the basic way that it works, I'd rather skip over that part, finish my, um, my talk about deployment, which I never really uh, finished up there, so you can sort of see how it would actually work in an enterprise. And then we might cover some advanced PKI stuff. But all, all the slides are there, um, and uh, I've got lots of cards, so you can send me questions um, after the fact. So is it okay we talk about deployment, and we'll, and we'll just kind of jump between PKI deployment and just regular internal deployment um, as we need to? All right. Okay, so um, we were on this slide here, and we, we talked about all the different um, things that can kind of be combined to secure um, traffic within the company, secure traffic between uh, firewalls or across a VPN tunnel, and also end-to-end -end traffic for, for remote access clients. Um, that's very good. Uh, I, I don't know if you know, but it... The, if you're using a third-party VPN client that's doing IPsec tunneling, uh, you may or may not be able to do IPsec end-to-end. -end. Uh, it depends on what they set the tunnel up for. Um, so it's just something to be worried about. Uh, if you're going to lock down machines on the inside of the network, make sure that whatever remote access solution you use can do IPsec end-to-end. -end. If your remote access users need to get to those resources. Okay, so this is the UI about how uh, group policy is used to set all the IPsec settings. Okay, um, and we've seen, uh, seen that a lot. But this is actually an example of the uh, directory uh, group policy object. I don't know if you can see up here, but it, it says, it gives a, a pretty complicated name which identifies the owner uh, in the directory who wrote this um, just as a, a naming convention tells you the exact domain that it's on, um, and then it talks about computer configuration, software settings, Windows settings, come down to security settings, and then underneath security settings, there's a bunch of things. What you don't see on the local machine are these public key policies, and this has to do with auto-enrollment of certificates and configuration of the, of PKI, the PKI store on the client. So what this is is automatic certificate request settings. I've got a, a slide in a second which will show you how that works. But in domain policy, you specify right here where to go get a cert, where the client can get a cert. Right here says trusted root certificate authorities. So if you want to give your clients a root or take away roots from your client PKI store, you do that with these settings here in a central area in the directory. <laughs> Enterprise trust, the same thing. Um, there's ways to issue other than roots there's ways to issue trusts for enterprises in group policy. Um, and then there's the IPsec policy um, as another security policy. 
All right. But if, if this is not obvious by now, it should be. <laughs> the, the network administrator is the one to set IPsec policy. Please do not inflict IPsec on, a, on a, a more or less regular server operator who basically knows how to do backup and restore. They're not going to get it, right? You got to understand IP packets and, and, and wire formats. You have to understand the traffic that the machine is receiving and sending um, in order to craft the IPsec policy. It's pretty easy once you get the hang of it, but um, it's, it's a lot to get the hang of uh, to start with for somebody that does, doesn't fundamentally understand how IP networking works. Okay, so we talked about the fact that uh, there's a policy, there's one policy active on the machine, and inside that policy there are multiple security rules. So in all of our demonstrations, you've seen multiple policies in the store. You can assign those policies however you want. In the directory, you may have hundreds of policies. Some are in use in one area of the company or in one set of machines, and some are in use in others. Okay, so different security rules inside one policy. The rules can be enabled or disabled via the checkbox. Um, it's worthwhile noting this uh, default response rule. We'll see how that's used in deployment. Uh, but basically, it, there's no filter associated with default response. The reason is, it's just a, a way to enable a client to respond to an ICE initiation, right? Uh, well, we'll talk about that later, because there's, there's some good slides that show how the protocol happens and what you have to do to configure. So we talked about how filters select traffic. Right, and we've seen that UI where you say source address, destination address. We can be specific down to the subnet um, and uh, actually specific IP address. And then if you want to, you can go into the protocol specification, source and desk port. Uh, we don't support port ranges uh, yet or in Whistler uh, because of the implementation difficulty in the, in the kernel of doing port range filtering. Uh, but we do plan to support it at some point. Okay, very important to understand. There, there, is a certain, there are certain types of traffic that IPsec does not filter. You saw how, this, how IPsec integrates with the stack. And IPsec will get uh, inbound traffic coming in and out um, through the IPsec driver. The, the, there's a couple of things. The, the whole integration in Windows 2000 is designed not as a firewall. It's designed to secure traffic. So if you're going to secure traffic, the only traffic that we can secure is unicast traffic. Okay, that is not multicast, not broadcast. So the IPsec driver will not filter broadcast or multicast traffic. So when you say from me to any, right, in a, in a, in a, in a filter, it will not try to negotiate security to a multicast group, and it won't try to negotiate security to a broadcast group. Likewise, it won't drop that traffic on receive. Okay. Um, so, three other protocols that are required, I'll just cover the last one because it's the most obvious, Ike. Um, of course, you need Ike UDP 500 to go in and out of the IPsec driver so that you can set up the IPsec security negotiation. Because Ike is primarily a listening service, um, you have to be able to receive it in uh, before you ever know that you're going to be secure. So there's no way that you can say, um, well, I should say no way, but there's not an easy way. It would certainly be extremely laborious to configure every UDP exemption to the otherwise uh, strong IPsec filtering that you have. So we just by default exempt UDP for port 500 uh, in the IPsec driver. So you have a, a traffic that says from anybody to me require IPsec, well they're going to be able to send you UDP 500 traffic. Kerberos. Because Kerberos is used by IPsec, um, we exempt it from the IPsec filtering. So if it looks like a Kerberos packet, UDP 88 or TCP 88, it will not, uh, it'll be filtered by the IPsec driver, but the IPsec driver will say, ah, this is Kerberos, and I should not do anything to Kerberos. And that's largely, uh, that has to do with a lot of things. Partially, it's because without Kerberos, you can't do a user login, and you can't do a machine login. Without a machine login, you can't get policy out of the directory. Without Kerberos, you, if you were using Kerberos to protect IPsec, um, to authenticate IPsec peers, you couldn't authenticate them. So you have to have Kerberos basically allowed out of band. <coughs> there could be some very complicated ways we could tighten this up, um, but in the end, it, one, of the, one in several Kerberos deployment scenarios and, and communication patterns result in us not knowing exactly what type of Kerberos traffic to exempt. Um, so we end up exempting it by default. 
RSVP. RSVP is the uh, resource reservation protocol used by QoS. Um, and we do support uh, diff serve enabled IPsec traffic. Okay, so if you have a, a QoS enabled application, that's quality of service, right? You're doing um, uh, basically uh, prioritization, uh, IP header prioritization using the diff serve code point in the IP header in your network. If you were doing that for some traffic type, then RSVP is allowed outside because RSVP has to talk to all the routers and you don't necessarily know in advance who you need to talk to uh, with RSVP. So it's exempt by default. It's IP protocol type 46. So except for those things, all the rest of the IP traffic can be filtered. In Whistler, we have some features to uh, tighten up the multicast and broadcast uh, filtering so we can filter those things. Um, but, and, and, and there's already a reg key to turn off Kerberos and RSVP exemptions. So by the time you're, so in Win2K with SP1, uh, IP broadcast, IP multicast, and Ike are exempt, right? You, you can't do anything about those. In Whistler, we'll have IP broadcast and multicast uh, exempt. I'm sorry, um, filterable, or at least permit block filterable. We still won't be able to negotiate security to them. All right, we talked about filter actions and how you set them. Um, remember, it's an ordered list of actions that you can build yourself. There's a bunch of settings. Uh, we'll talk about two of those uh, settings in a little bit in more detail. The lifetimes down here we didn't talk too much about, but basically you can specify to generate a new key in the background automatically um, while IPsec is protecting traffic. So if you have a lifetime set, um, we will enforce that lifetime so that a new key will be used by the time that limit, we call that the hard limit, is reached. So before that limit is reached, we recognize that and we rekey. It's both in bytes and in time, in seconds. All right, um, so these are the two checkboxes that we'll see how they're used in deployment. On a filter act, you have a filter, describes the traffic that you want to secure. But you also um, want to enable a couple of different behaviors. One is a, um, the ability to receive plain text connection requests, but then respond back with security. Okay, so this is a way that all your clients can be, have this default response rule enabled. They just, they don't do anything with IPsec, but it, if somebody requests IPsec of them, they'll respond, and they'll respond in the right way. So with the default response rule, you can use this checkbox on the server to receive client incoming TCP requests. The SYN ACK, right, that goes back to the client will get trapped by the IPsec driver, and then uh, because you're you know, because it's got an IPsec filter on the server, it'll negotiate security back with the client. And uh, we'll see in pictorial detail how that works. The other one is, well, what happens if I've got down-level servers or down-level clients in my network? Again, we're trying to roll this out across an enterprise. You want an IPsec secure server, but you don't necessarily want to deny connectivity. You could, but if you don't want to deny connectivity, as in the case with our build servers, Right? We have build servers, but we have standalone machines that have no credentials whatsoever that need to update their build. So it would be, we have a fallback to clear option. Now this is fallback to clear if there's no Ike reply. If the guy is IPsec enabled, if the, if the client is IPsec enabled and he tries to negotiate IPsec and he fails, well clearly he knew how to establish security to something and the security policies just failed and the authentication failed and so forth. We will not fall back to clear. So it's only if the guy does not reply to Ike. All right, so in an enterprise rollout, you can safely secure, I'll say secure, you can turn on IPsec on a server, have the fallback to clear set, you won't deny connectivity to anybody, it'll be delayed by three seconds, right? Because we fall back to clear in three seconds if, if there is no Ike reply. We'll continue to try for a minute just to make sure it's not an attack, um, but we will, if you check that checkbox, you'll fall back to clear. All right, and then we've talked uh, ad nauseum, I guess, about the authentication methods. It's an or again, it's an ordered list of authentication methods, um, so you can have several. Uh, this goes on about the pre-shared key that we've talked about. This is the URL, which still, I checked uh, two weeks ago or so when we submitted the slides. That's the URL for that paper describing um, how uh, pre-shared key guessing can be done and how XAuth is insecure if the pre-shared key becomes known. All right, so then we talked about uh, local machine certificates. 
where they're stored, and how to get them. This is the example in domain policy where you have an automatic certificate request setting. And if you expand that out, this is the little dialog that you'll get. It says certificate type, computer, certificate purpose, client authentication, server authentication, certificate authorities, and then you pick the CA or a, or a, a series of CAs that you want to get a, you want the client to request a cert from. So when the client boots up, the machine that is, when the machine boots on the network, it finds its domain controller, it does a machine login, this all happens before the user logs in, it pulls down the machine policy for that machine, it evaluates the, the machine policy, it finds out that it has an auto enroll setting, it sees that stress CA is the machine to go to, and it does a Kerberized encrypted RPC DCOM enrollment protocol with the MSCA. Okay, so I just uh, mentioned that briefly. If in the Active Directory, you define group policy, all the stuff that you can set, essentially, in, in all these settings, not just IPsec, but all the other settings can be defined centrally in the directory and applied to machines. The machine accounts have to live in that OU hierarchy, that is, you can move a machine account, a machine account around. But if you've got a series of desktops for your finance division, they join the domain, move their machine accounts into the OU, and you can apply policy to control that particular box, um, as well as the users. Okay, so this is the way that this is central configuration of IPsec policy. So for the domain level, you can set client responder, just a simple default response policy for the entire domain. And that just enables them to, to be able to do Kerberos-based uh, IPsec negotiation. Then for certain servers around your enterprise, you can turn on the server policy, and the clients will just automatically go secure, transparent to your applications. All right, so this is a way in, in different OUs or organizational units, you can assign policy in what's called the group policy object, the GPO. Uh, there's some good walkthroughs and white papers from the group policy team about all about the group policy infrastructure and how it works. Um, IPsec is just a piece of that policy. You can set IPsec policy locally, as we've shown, but you can also do it centrally in the directory. So, for example, you can have the server OU, and the server OU will deliver policies of IPsec secure servers to just to that group. Again, the machine, where the machine account lives in the domain is, it determines the policy assignment. Right, and then the client policy can be, if the clients live in the, in the domain, fine. If you've moved them down into the computer's container for a lower OU, they'll get whatever policy um, you want to apply. So the, the thing to realize is that it's the bottom most domain policy applies to the client in IPsec's case. And since there's only one policy that can, uh, that can apply, we don't try to merge policies. So if you have a domain policy that's set for client only, client responder only, and then you have a server OU down here and you assigned IPsec policy to the server OU that doesn't have default response, it's the last policy that's picked up as it walks the chain down that it actually applies on the machine. And domain policy always overrides local policy. Even though I'm a local admin and I can go in and I can assign policy, um, I've got to shut down the IPsec policy agent service uh, in order for my domain policy not to take effect. Because my... What's that? Admin, local, it has to be local admin. Right, so any, any power user, any, I, I don't know if power users have service control off the top of my head, I can't remember that particular point. They may have service control authority. I know server operators have service control authority, but I can't remember about power users. But in any case, regular users um, don't have the ability to control services on their, on their desktop. Is there a way to block them if they don't log on as an authenticated user? Well, if they, if they say they shut down the IPsec policy, for example, yeah. so they log on, they're not, they have their own custom IPsec policy. Right. And they don't want to use the group policy that you're pushing on them. Is there any way to just tell them to not grant them a ticket to Kerberos or whatever and deny their login or deny them some faith in the IPsec? Um, there, if, if the user has shut down the IPsec policy agent service, if, if a local admin first, yeah. A local admin has shut down the IPsec policy agent service, then, then he doesn't have IPsec, and so he can't talk to machines that are IPsec enabled. If he, if he goes into the registry, completely hacks out the, the, domain, the cache of the domain policy, then it is possible for him to set his own local policy. But the very next time that the policy agent polls, or the group policy system polls the directory, 
to find out if there's policy assigned. It'll find out and it'll download it and it'll override whatever you set locally. So he has to have the policy on, on the device to check. Yes. Just pulled out policy That's correct. Policy. It's integrated with Ike. Ike runs as a dependent service of the policy agent. Okay. Right. That's one. Okay. Yeah. Um, in the IPsec policy, I didn't show you, but in the general tab, is you define how often it polls for IPsec policy changes. For group policy changes, there's two types of changes. One is assignment, right, in this, in this hierarchy. You can have different policy assigned. You can have a change in that. Or you can have a change in the actual IPsec policy details that are already assigned, okay? So two types of polling. When logon does polling for group policy assignment changes, Right? Once the policy is assigned and the IPsec policy agent has pulled it down, it has a polling interval to go and detect changes in its own policy. It's settable. In the IPsec policy, it's settable. Um, I think it's five minutes up to 48 hours. I don't think so for polling. I mean, the, the impact of a client polling every five minutes doing an LDAP query to the directory is high. So I would not advise that. I mean, un unless you're rolling out for testing, like you just want to test it, and you, and you might want to tweak the group policy in the directory really quickly, and you want clients to pick it up, then you might have a five minute polling interval. But as soon as you feel like people are connected and the people have the policy, then you want to set it back to eight hours or something you know, long. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, I, I don't know of a, of, a, of a clean way to solve that problem, right? To know, that a, to, to know that a particular client is not applying the domain policy that's assigned to it. Uh, for some reason, they temporarily whacked it and put in their own policy. The, um, the resource kit utility, by the way, um, and this is documented in the resource kit, but you should know, that's probably in the slides, that um, there's an ipsecpoll.exe command which is in the resource kit utility, it does allow a local admin to modify policy. But, it, but it, it can create policy so you can script it. I mean, the whole point there was to provide a scripting utility, a command line scriptable utility. So you can build up IPsec policy, you have the script to build it. I don't know, you store the script somewhere, but basically you have a way to just automatically generate it. So you can generate policies in the directory, you can generate policies through a script on the local machine, and you can assign them active on the local machine. You can't assign them active automatically uh, through the directory without a lot of extra work. But in our tool, you can build a policy, and then you can assign it active on the local machine if you want to. Um, so that will allow you to build policy. It will not allow you to override domain policy except for what's called dynamic policy. So there's this idea that you can, you can whack in a temporary uh, block or a temporary permit or some other kind of overriding policy to what's currently active in the active state as local admin. And the reason we permit that is because it may be useful. Uh, but secondly, there's, no, there's nothing to prevent us, prevent the whole system from um, not doing what the local admin ultimately wants to do, right? Because once you've got local admin, you can shut down the service, you can whack the policy cache, you can change the policy cache. There's nothing that the service can do about that anymore. You can change the file system. I understand, <laughs> I, yeah. Um, in the ability, you're, the, yeah, in the, in the end, I mean, what you control is the policy on the other side, yeah. right? So they'll have to use the same credential, right? If they've got a cert, they've got a cert, yeah. right? If they've got Kerberos, if they've done a machine login, they, their machine has done a machine login. Yeah. So they'll be identified when they communicate, and, the, and they won't be able to negotiate any security setting that you didn't set on the other side as acceptable. Yes. That's true. That's true. And they could they could take away blocking filters for NetBIOS, for example, or you know, or something kind of silly. Yeah, they can also have services like they can run the server on their yep. machine or whatever. Yeah. Again, local I mean local admin, they've got control of the box. So um, okay. So there's some issues with policy consideration. I'm, I think I'm going to skip that because I want um, I'll, I can come back to it. It's there in there. If you're going to deploy IPsec in a, a large enterprise, you should read those. Uh, we've been through this diagram. Um, how IPsec policy is interpreted. 
This is important to understanding the response, the initiation and the response behavior based on a policy. So there's the filter, right? The filter with the additional flag of whether it's a transport or tunnel um, encapsulation. And it's going to get sorted, right? Because you can have a policy which has arbitrary number of rules. All these rules have filters. Manually ordering all that stuff uh, is going to be very difficult. Um, and in fact, we do not support manual ordering of filters in the IPsec policy. Um, you probably should, there's a lot of reasons why, but the bottom line is uh, it gets to be very complicated. And in the end, a policy which is created on the directory that's applied on the end system where the administrator can reorder filters or other things can do things with filters on the end system, you still can't guarantee that this is the order in which things will apply. So it would be kind of a false guarantee. You could manually order them, but it would only be manually ordered in the sense that nothing else affected them on the local machine. So what we do is we, we, we take all the filters in the policy, we, we, we get the policy, we get all the rules, we get all the filter lists for all the rules, we sort them in a most specific order. So the, very, so the most specific filters will apply first, right down to the most general filters, and then if it happens to um, apply the, the default response rule. So as, if we have filters, there's no filter for default response, but if we have filters in the policy, they get sorted as I described and they get given down to the IPsec driver. So on outbound, right, IPsec can see the full packet in the clear. So it can see what traffic to exempt or what traffic to negotiate security for in the clear uh, as traffic goes out of the box. IPsec driver runs in kernel mode, but Ike doesn't run in kernel mode. Ike and the policy agent are all in user mode. Okay, so we've been, been through that diagram, right? Okay, as a responder, so what, what, what we didn't see here is how to, we kind of understand on the, on the initiator side how this works. Policy gets interpreted, we have filters here, we're looking at traffic going out, we find something, we negotiate, and then we send it secure. But how does this guy know, right? There's a policy lookup. This guy's contacted as a responder. He doesn't, all he has is the IP address of the other guy. He's gonna do a main mode authentication. He's gotta choose authentication methods and trust um, uh, key sizes and encryption algorithms just based on the guy's source IP. So the way this works is that there's two policy tables. There's a main mode policy table which governs whether or not you're gonna reply to a client. Um, with Ike, and we, we use just the address part of the filter for that. So we take the address part, including the subnet specification, and put it in the main mode policy table. This is what determines my ability to reply to an Ike request. Okay, if I don't have policy to, to reply to somebody, if I'm secure to you and secure to you, and that's it, then if he sends me a packet, I'm not gonna reply to him. So he just times out, he sends and sends and sends, I'm not gonna reply because I only have traffic to be secure to you and to be secure to you. But if I'm a server and I have a traffic to be secure from any to me, well then I will apply to any Ike packet I get. And that's, that's why the filters matter, right? So I can have, I can be blocking traffic to you and blocking traffic to you. I can be from any to me, right, doing something else. And as long as there's a from any to me, I'll reply to anyone. What I'll do is only what quick mode is gonna tell me in a second. So, from, so we take the address information and put it in a main mode policy table for, for responding. Um, for drop, drop. We don't send back an ICMP or anything. We just drop it. Um, we could, you know, so fine. There's, now we have the full filter, right, which is essentially our communications um, security policy, or it's, it's our what traffic we're willing to secure, what traffic we're gonna permit, what traffic we're gonna block, right? So we take the full filter and put that in our quick mode policy table. So the bottom line is once I set up authentication with the IPsec, uh, sorry, the Ike SA or the ISAC AMP SA, right, I have an authenticated channel, now we can negotiate quick mode, and now when you send me a request to secure UDP 1701, I look in my quick mode policy table and say, do I have a filter for UDP 1701? Okay, and this is why those source addresses and dest addresses in the, in the, for the filter for UDP matter. Because if, if somebody is requesting 
for all source ports going to a particular desk port, and my responder policy is from a particular source port to a particular desk port, I can't accept that, okay? So there's a most specific match concept in, in the policy negotiation as well. All right, so I just basically described that. I get a I get an inbound Ike message to UDP port 500. It has a source port. I have to use my main mode policy table just based on the IP address of the, of the initiator to look up and figure out how I'm going to do main mode. This is why we did main mode settings in the policy as a whole. Because trying to do main mode settings for every single filter got to be, first of all, very difficult to configure. Um, and then secondly, we knew we were going to do the quick mode policy uh, as a responder, so we would end up picking the right policy if we could. Okay? So based on the full IPsec filter, that's how we set up the IPsec SA as a responder. And of course, the, you know, the drafts don't, aren't specific about how all this happens. They just talk about the wire protocol. So it's up to vendors. And we were the first transport implementation, right? We were the first people out there building an operating system, putting IPsec in the operating system, and trying to figure out how all this policy gets negotiated. So finally, HPUX and AIX and so forth have something similar. Um, Intel and 3Com have uh, down-level uh, Windows clients for their cards and so forth. So there are other clients, but pretty much everybody has talked to us and we kind of agree on the way to do it. All right, we've seen IPsec and ESP. Now, huh? <laughs> I, I think we had better pictures than yours. <laughs> Ideally, right, the whole reason we put IPsec and the whole reason the ITF designed IPsec was to do end-to-end -end security between two IP addresses. Now, the router vendors will tell you end-to-end -end security is between the two IP addresses of the routers. I, as an end-system vendor, will tell you end-to-end -end security is between the IP addresses of the hosts. Um, in any case, the only other model that we kind of have to understand this is SSL, right? But SSL is controlled by the applications. Application does an SSL connect. Um, it does one-way authentication, not bidirectional authentication. It's doing it only for that application connection, right? So think about SSL. Think, think that IPsec transport mode or IPsec end-to-end -end is like SSL, only you administratively define what you want to protect, and it's transparent to the app. Okay, so here's the way to do the most secure server model, right? What we have here, do you have the laser pointer? Okay, got it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and the coffee. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, let's let's look at the um, well. Let's look at the the server. This is a custom, most secure server policy. I say custom because the example policies that we provide in Windows 2000, the default policies, are just samples. They weren't intended for you to just activate, turn on, and it'll work. And the online help says this, but the policy itself does not say that because the policy itself had to be localized and they wanted to conserve on the amount of words localized, so I had to take out the explanation that this is just a sample, you should build your own policy and put that in every, every policy. So in the end, they look like real policies, but you define your own, okay? <laughs> so with a custom secure policy, um, you'll say something like secure from me to any destination, all traffic and that's mirrored, right? Or from any to me, all traffic mirrored, right? You can, the most secure says, don't allow clear text in, okay? I will receive no plain text TCP connects, I'll receive no UDP connection requests, not, no ICMP, nothing. All unicast IP traffic to me must be IPsec encrypted, okay? Now that we know the exemptions, RSVP, Kerberos, and Ike, okay? You can turn off Kerberos and RSVP and, and with a, uh, a reg key and SP1, but you still got to receive Ike if you're going to do IPsec. Um, no, I don't have a hard um, estimation of the amount of state that a particular SA takes. I know we can support easily 5,000, 10,000 clients, which is 20,000 security associations. So it, it, there's not really, it, the limit is in memory, is in kernel memory. And that's, to, that's a certain fixed percentage of your total um, RAM on the machine. In user mode, it's just virtual memory, so it can grow large. Um, so you, really, your only constraint is kernel mode. Okay, so, but I'm, in this particular example, I'm gonna trust domain members, 
right? I could have trusted those who have a certificate from CA root uh, one or something, but I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna do domain members. So, so if that's my policy, how is, I mean, I'm not gonna receive any clear text. The only thing I'm gonna do is receive Ike. I'm not even gonna send Ike to anybody unless I get a Ike, you know, Ike initiation. So how does the client communicate to me now? The client has to know. He's gotta have policy to initiate to me. So somehow, and, and group policy central configuration is one way to do it, somehow the client has to have a custom policy. And in this case I say, you know, in general send in the clear, because he's talking to proxies and he's talking in his network, okay? But he has to know that when he contacts a particular IP address in the network, this server IP address, he's going to uh, must secure traffic to server IP. Okay, so he's got, a, he's got a rule with a filter list, with a filter that says, from me, whatever client IP address he has, to that server IP, do some filter action, negotiate security. And the authentication method on there is gonna be trust domain members. Okay, so the way this works, um, they're both members of the domain, they wake up in the morning, they boot, they get their ticket granting <coughs> ticket, uh, which establishes their Kerberos credentials. And now because the client ran an application that used a DNS name that resolved to an IP address, which happened to be that server, now an IP packet tries to go out of that box going to the server. And the IPsec filter is down there waiting. Okay, boom, I've got it, I see it, I'm gonna negotiate security. And in this case, he's gonna, or he's gonna propose uh, Kerberos because his trust model, his authentication method is Kerberos. And the server is gonna accept Kerberos as an authentication method in the rule. So what happens there is that the server accepts Kerberos as an authentication method, and then the client has to go to the KDC and get a ticket, a session ticket, to talk to that host. Okay, it's just a, it's a host ticket. Okay, it's not a service ticket. We're not talking to any particular application on the server. We're just trying to talk to the server. So it's an RFC Kerberos ticket for the host. And this is why we work interoperably with other MIT Kerberos implementations is because there's nothing special about this ticket. All the other Kerberos talk you, you hear about um, extensions that we made for user authorization have nothing to do here, right? And we're only using Kerberos to establish trust. So I go get a host ticket to talk to that guy. Um, and in fact, it all, you know, assuming we, we have the right Kerberos relationship, we end up with IPsec Security Association. Yeah, if you configure, if these are two Win2K boxes, then they have to be configured to be members of that Sun KDC realm, but yes, it'll work. Yeah, shouldn't, shouldn't be any problem. And the only problem is the configuration you've gotta do on those boxes. But if there are two servers, configuration is minimal. You can have it done in a couple hours, and then <laughs> that's it. I say a couple of hours because you'll spend that time reading how to do it and testing it, that's all. It only, it only, you know, if you know exactly what you're doing, it only takes 15 minutes. Okay, so then the very first packet, okay, so the very first packet that the app of the application that goes out gets IPsec protected, right? So, any, so you would use this model if you have a server on the internet, possibly, right? And you have a way that clients can be configured to talk securely to that server. So this is essentially the model that the VPN server has, right? It's just that the client has this auto policy, right? It knows the destination IP and it automatically configures its policy. You could do um, server to server uh, across the internet or between your DMZs for business to business sharing of data, right? You could lock down the two servers. You could give certs only to those two machines. They may not uh, have a common KDC, but you could do certs on either machine or God forbid you could do a pre-shared key um, between two servers and make this work. So I show a client, but it could be two servers doing this. But the very first packet that goes across will be secure. So if you had a session, if you had a UDP application or you had a TCP application, well, TCP is a bad example. If you had a UDP application that sent very sensitive data like user ID and password in the very first packet, this would be your only model to really protect that traffic on the wire. Okay, so that's a little hard to manage because all the clients have to know where all the secure servers are, right? But it is the most secure way to deploy, right? So the second way to deploy, and this is the way that, that we see really everybody going, um, and the way that uh, our internal guys are doing it, is that the client has just the responder only policy, right? He sends in the clear, secure traffic only if requested, 
and trust domain members. He just has default response rule enabled. So it's a default domain policy, has, has only one rule, and that's default response rule. And that's to do Kerberos or maybe other certificates um, as an authentication method. So the secure, <laughs> again, naming, killing me. The secure server policy is the name that is in the sample, okay? What's, what makes that different from the server policy as opposed to what it makes it secure versus not secure is that the server policy falls back to clear if the client doesn't reply. The secure server uses a filter action that does not fall back to clear. Okay, so in the secure server, it's secure from me to any destination. So it's gonna secure or make sure that all outbound traffic that it sends must be secure. And we're gonna leverage the fact that we have two-way communication with clients and servers like TCP connections to set this up. We're gonna use the natural protocol flow to drive IPsec establishment. So I'm secure from me to any destination, all unicast, except unsecured traffic. So this is the key. This guy doesn't know the server's secure, so he's gonna send clear text to everybody. When he happens to send clear text to the server, this guy is configured in his filter action to accept unsecured traffic. And then when he does secure traffic to any destination, he's gonna trust domain members. All right, so let's look at how that works. Um, yeah, well, actually, it's, it's, it's whatever Kerberos realm you're a member of, or uh, you're told that the other guy's in. If you can get a Kerberos credential to the other guy, um, great. I mean, it'll work. Does that make sense? Okay. So, again, both of them are a member of a KDC realm. They get their ticket granting ticket when they boot up. Now the client sends this TCP connect request or a UDP session request, something to the server. The client doesn't know the server's secure. The server is configured to allow this inbound packet, but on reply, I show it going up to the application, but that could be the TCP stack. On reply, the packet goes back out and now it hits the IPsec filter. And the filter's saying secure from me to any, okay? So now the server is gonna negotiate back to the client. Whereas before, in the previous picture, we saw the client having to know about the server and initiating to the server. Here's a way you can just turn up secure servers in your, in your enterprise, and clients will just be automatically secure, right? So now your server admins or your network admin can go and just secure all the exchange servers. They can secure all the other file servers or finance servers or whatever they want. And as long as you had a general way to respond on the client, you're golden, right? There's, so because it's a little bit in reverse, now the server is initiating security to the client. The client says, hey, I'll do Kerberos, and uh, gives the server back the, its principal name so you can go and get a session ticket to talk to that principal, basically the host. So it goes and gets a host ticket to talk to that client. And this works across all the Kerberos referral models. We didn't go into that in too much detail, but if the guy's in a trusted domain or a trusted realm, then you get a ref uh, the server will get a referral to go to the, the, the right realm and then get a ticket to talk to the guy, to the, the end system. Okay, and then, assumably, the policy, uh, the quick mode policies, the filters agree, and they will set up IPsec between them. Okay? Yeah. Two minutes, great. All right, so now what that means is that the re server's response is now secure, but we have bidirectional security set up. And, and the whole, remember the default response rule, that filter said dynamic? What happens is whatever filter the server proposes to the client, the client will accept, right? As long as there's authentication, the client says, I don't care what traffic you wanna send me, I sent you a request, you know, tell me what to secure. So he could secure all traffic, he could secure a certain port traffic, it doesn't matter, it's whatever the server proposes to the client. The client dynamically plums that filter, two filters an outbound filter and an inbound filter. So now all traffic between the client and the server will be secured, right? What happens is the server just dies, just goes away. You know, something happens to the server, server crashes, reboots, or goes offline or something. You know, that filter is still sitting on the client, right? So you don't want these filters to live forever, right? So there's a, there's a trade-off. It lives for an hour, okay? So after an hour, if there's no communication at all, secure communication at all between the two guys, the filters age out and we dynamically delete them so that you don't build up state on the client. Okay? Is that something you just set off? No. It's, it's right now it's just one hour. So it's not, not tweakable. All right. 
Um, just a couple more scenarios and, and we'll be done. The, uh, the biggest use I've seen of IPsec so far is to secure traffic between DCs across some other untrusted path or to get all the traffic between the DCs through a firewall that, that only has a small hole open, which is the IPsec hole, right, for Ike and uh, ESP. And um, there's just guidance on how to do that. And the only caveat there is you can't be running NAT on either side, right, because IPsec is not going to work through NAT. So a gentleman asked me during the break earlier, well, does that mean that my DC is on the internet? And I said, it means that your DC has an internet routable IP address if, if, if you're using the internet as your transport network, okay? What it means also is that the firewall is only allowing IPsec traffic. So if for some reason this guy misconfigures, right, or turns off the IPsec or, or something happens, right, you've got another layer of filtering there saying only IPsec traffic will get through. And that, that's sort of a requirement. If you're going to put your DC with an internet routable IP address, technically reachable from the internet, you better have filters to require only IPsec in front of it. Okay, well, all right, let's, let's be clear. This is IPsec transport between the two, end to end between the two DCs. You can run a tunnel between the firewalls, in which case all the traffic in the middle is secure. And, and you can actually NAT it. In some cases, I, th I think most of the protocols, DC to DC, you can NAT. So if, if you had to NAT for here or over here, then you would end up doing a gateway to gateway tunnel, right, between the firewalls or between two routers in the middle, and then NATing on the other side and just not use IPsec end to end. Okay. It won't, it just won't go through NAT. That's the, I'm, yeah. Okay, um, one of the things that we, we have tried to discourage people from doing is IPsec is okay between clients and servers and servers and servers in the domain. But trying to do IPsec from a domain member to a DC is difficult. And right now, we do not support this. We, when I say we don't support it, it's not because you can't do it. It's because the configuration required to make it work is, is probably more than you want to tackle, particularly if you've got replicated DCs up here. Um, so I did a very detailed investigation with the NT security team on how to make this work in Whistler. Um, and we are going forward and testing the scenario, so we will have it documented for you if you want to do this. Um, it's just that it's, you know, it, it's, hard, it's hard to do, and there's just too many issues to explain um, why. I mean, the, the most obvious point is that if you've got, po if, if you lock down the DC with IPsec, well, nobody can join. All right. You know? Yeah, it's secure. So a gentleman was like, I've got a CA, it's locked down with, with IPsec, but how do I access it with IPsec? Okay. So chicken and egg issues you want to um, avoid. So I, sh I typically show, you know, this is, cur this is a security boundary inside the domain and you might be doing IPsec inside uh, between systems. And uh, this is the exact filter uh, and the rule structure. Um, notice that I'm exempting, right, if, if I'm doing IPsec essentially for all traffic between these guys, I'm exempting it to each DC IP address, and I'm exempting it to the DACP server, which is most likely not IPsec enabled. I'm exempting it to my default gateway, because I, I, I send traffic to my default gateway, but I don't want to secure it with IPsec. I want to exempt it to DNS IP addresses, and I may choose to exempt ICMP. It just depends on whether I, I want to protect ICMP or whether I don't, okay? So, so it's a filter that has, it's a filter list that has all these things defined, and then the filter action is permit, okay? And then the filter to secure traffic is me to any IP, all protocols, right? Standard exemptions plus these exemptions will apply. And, trip, and filter action will be triple DES, off method, Kerberos only. So that will essentially lock down all these guys. And the only, only systems they will talk to, I'll say in an insecure way, but there are other application defined security methods, is uh, to the DC. Okay. And, you know, and so I, I explain this, and then the guy says, well, I'm running my SQL server on the DC, and I've got websites running on the DC, and I want to secure that stuff. Uh, it's hard. All right. So there's. 
let's see, there's issues. Um, you can read these things, hopefully, in the slides. There are ways to, if you have separate domains, right? We're, we're trying to go to a model where we have secure communications, right? But yet we, for user authentication, we may isolate systems here and isolate systems here, but we may still want to enable IP connectivity between the two systems, right? So you could lock down IPsec in here, lock down IPsec in there, but if you tried to do IPsec between the two, it won't work. So the way you solve that um, is you can use a different security, uh, a different authentication method than Kerberos between the two guys. And the way you would do that is deploy certs. So now we get into a deeper rabbit hole about how can you combine Kerberos and certificates in a trust infrastructure. Um, in the end, it's authenticated communication. So if you just see IPsec as a way to establish trusted communication, then the rest of the issues about how do I authenticate myself, how do I trust myself with IPsec kind of flow out of that. Okay. So you can enable, across untrusted domains, you can enable uh, communication with IPsec using certs um, or the bad other method. Um, you can also do something like use auto-enrollment, right? Use a CA in this guy and a CA in this guy. They chain to the common root. Even though the domains aren't trusted, you can still auto-enroll the machines and use that for IPsec purposes to establish IP connectivity, even though the users would not authenticate for some reason. There are, you know, there are applications that will pop up. You know, if you're not authenticated, you can do net use slash WAC, you, you know, U colon, whatever. That could be useful. So if you need that, that's how you make it happen. If you need also IPsec, you know, flying graphics. <laughs> Um, we talked a little bit about deploying machine certificates. I'll kind of skip over that. And we talked about tunnel mode. Let me just show you the, the cases. So if you're doing Windows 2000 between an RAS, a, a Windows 2000 gateway, and another Windows 2000 or L2TP IPsec ca capable gateway, this is what we recommend. The reason we recommend it is because it's a routable interface. People understand routing. They understand gateway to gateway tunnels across the internet that send all traffic based on the dest IP through the tunnel as a routable interface. Um, and it's just easier to manage. If you have to talk to a third party gateway or something else, you could use IPsec pure tunnel mode. And we go through the configuration like you've seen. Um, but we, you know, we've run um, at least uh, with 16 other vendors simultaneously, Windows 2000 was the only one to have an IPsec tunnel up with all of them simultaneously all the time. Um, at the, uh, it was a Spring N plus I last year that I, I set that demo up. So it was a great demo for our interoperability for IPsec tunnel mode. But that's not surprising because we worked on that with Cisco. Okay, so Windows 2000 NT4 RS gateway, if you, if you have those, um, PPTP tunnel would be the only uh, alternative. All right. So, uh, Right. So if you had a, if you had a gateway, if, if this were a Windows 2000 gateway and you had some really insecure path that you needed to secure, right, your remote access users are coming in, they're secure across the internet, but you still care about being secure across some large internal corporate network, um, or maybe you're VPNing into uh, a, a network like a government network or a educational network that is still across the internet here, but you want them to get to like your, um, your university administrative employees want to do VPN access to the, quote, university network. Um, they have a specific VPN server to come into, but you want to give them access back into the data center so they can run their finance applications or their um, student grade applications. What you can do is secure this traffic and make sure that nothing gets into the, this network without being IPsec protected. And so what you'd end up doing is saying, is knowing that all these guys get addresses from a particular remote access subnet the gateway policy would establish an IPsec tunnel, mandatorily tunnel them, right, based on their source subnet, desk subnet, subnet B down here. It's just a very simple IPsec tunnel. So on a Windows 2000 VPN server, you can mandatorily encrypt traffic on behalf of your remote access clients across whatever path you're going to forward them to. I show here terminating a, um, a tunnel into the router. You know, that would be the case if these were mainframes. Um, down here that don't support IPsec. So the idea is you want to do IPsec as far as possible um, that meets your management needs. Um, same thing here. If I've got just a regular client that's sending an original IP packet, right, he can, he can forward it at some point, at some router, somewhere in the network, we'll decide that this, need, this traffic needs to be secured. 
And if it, let's say it's going to an end host, right, then it could set up an IPsec tunnel from a gateway to an end system. Right, we saw end system to end system tunnels working. Well, the real reason we support IPsec tunnel mode is to talk to routers or talk to gateways. Um, the point here is that there's no address assignment. It's RFC compatible tunnel, tunneling. So your tunnel header right here is the IP header, I'm sorry, the IP address of the router interface and the IP address of the server. Right, we're not do, it's not a remote access scenario. This is a internal inside the network, right, or across the internet. Uh, there's only one IP address, or at least there's, there's one IP address that you're tunneling between, and you're not, it's not remote access, right? And so in the end, your, your original packet gets stuffed inside the tunnel, it reaches the end system, it detunnels it, and you've got your original IP packet again, right? But, the, but this is the IP header, and this is the IP header. It's the same IP header. There was never any uh, address assignment going on. All right, and we've seen how to deploy policy. Let me, um, I, since you guys are so, uh, so attentive, um, let me talk a little bit about, um, well, just two slides just to help Intel and 3Com out. I mentioned uh, before you saw how the uh, IPsec could be done in hardware acceleration. These are really old numbers uh, from, uh, from middle of last year, but basically on a particular hardware configuration, don't worry about what it is right now, they were only able to do um, 20 megabits per second software encrypted with hardware offload, and that's maxing the CPU, right, max CPU. If you put hardware offload in, you can run it, and they're showing, 3Com showing about 85 megabits per second, and there's still just above 50% CPU utilization um, at, at a maximum line rate. Okay, that's a 100 megabit card transmitting 85 megabits per second, which is near theoretical, right, um, encryption. So, and, and you're still not maxing your CPU. Uh, same thing for Intel. Intel has similar things. Um, they're showing for DES. They're showing they were, for their particular hardware configuration, they were able to push about 40 megabits per second software when they maxed the CPU. When they added the offload, then um, they were able to go up to line rate. And um, again, with triple DES, they saw the same thing. Without offload, um, 20 megabits per second. So they had 40 megabits per second in DES, same hardware configuration, 20 megabits for triple DES. Basically twice as expensive, or it's actually more. 2.5 times, but anyway, with offload, they're able to um, really push seven, they say 70, but their, high, their figures are higher now for 100 megabit. So the only downside is that if you have a gigabit ethernet interface and it does not go to 100, it's not auto-sensing. So if you have a fiber gigabit or, or you have a, uh, some other kind of gigabit interface that will not go to 10, 100, not do 100 uh, sensing, then there is no card right now that will communicate gigabit ethernet and also do offload. Same thing for FDDI, FDDI direct termination or a DS3 card that direct terminates into the box. Um, those cards right now are not supporting IPsec offload. They can, but they just don't have the support in there. So I would urge you, if you have particular offload requirements to get in touch with uh, the NIC vendor that you use and uh, say, hey, why don't you guys support this IPsec offload because we want to IPsec encrypt our traffic. They get enough of those requests and they'll see the business value and they'll, they'll do it. So I, I do know the schedules for gigabit ethernet um, from uh, some vendors, and uh, I probably shouldn't comment on it, but it, they'll get to it. <laughs> um, they, they'll get to it as soon as, uh, quote, as soon as they can. Um, and that's probably all I can say publicly. Have you done any testing to see what a uh, multiprocessor system, what that demands on multiprocessor system? Yeah, uh, we did a VPN study. We put four Intel NICs, four Intel server NICs, 100 megabit server NICs, into a, uh, a four proc Xeon 550 with, I don't know, 500 mega RAM or something. But basically we were able to do uh, 5,000 clients sustained at 22 kil kilobits per second triple DES, simultaneous 5,000 clients constantly transmitting 22 kilobits, which is approximately a rough average of what a remote access tunnel would be. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. It'll all be done in software. So all the, if, you, if, if offload is not available in hardware, then it will be done in software. And in fact, you can fill the card. So the card only holds a certain amount, right? 5,000, I think, is the max for Intel and 3Com. There's a reg key. They, by default in server, they install with 2,500 client-supported, uh, sorry, um, 2,500 security associations. 
which is 1250 clients because you've got two. Okay, so 12, 1250 security associations simultaneously active transmitting data is the max, is the default configuration. They can go up to 5,000 on the server, uh, which is 2,500 clients simultaneously active. Yeah, yeah. I would, you know, it depends on your security requirement. If you need privacy for traffic, you can, anyway. if you need privacy for traffic, you can, you can do filtering just for the port traffic that you need privacy on. If you want to lock the whole machine down from a, from a trust access point, just use AH or use ESP null encryption for that. So you can, again, with, you can get really creative in terms of exactly the traffic you want to encrypt, exactly the traffic that you want to ensure is trusted, and the rest of it can go in the clear you, um, with the policy. Yeah, you can get crazy. Yeah, you can get crazy. Yeah. Any questions? So that's, that's pretty much it. We have a whole bunch of uh, advanced deployment stuff that will just uh, go into ad nauseum. Uh, we'll probably redo this in uh, the July Black Hat, but I, I don't think we'll get through nearly as much as we've gotten through today, right? Because we've, we've been pretty lucky. Got good demos and, um, and good content so far, I think. So, yeah, oh, an interop. Oh, that's true. Show interoperability. So um, as always, if, uh, if network security is your thing, um, I couldn't be a sponsor of the conference and not invite you to, uh, you know, look on our website for opportunities with us. Um, uh, so, if you were interested in building protocols or in doing something else, I'd be happy to give you my card. And you can get in touch with me later. Uh, it depends on what you do. Um, Web TV is down in San Francisco. Um, we have consulting forces all over the place, yeah, but I, I really don't want to, you know, recruit. I just, you know, mention. Okay, so there is a reception. Yeah. So I'll be here all day tomorrow. I, I have to leave around 5 tomorrow. So if you want to catch me anytime, feel free. And Dan and I will be here as well. So feel free to stop us. Since you asked for